Movement through the plasma membrane. In this part of the lecture, we're going to look at diffusion, osmosis, filtration, and then the mediated transport mechanisms such as facilitated diffusion, active transport, and secondary active transport. Now diffusion is the movement of solutes from an area of high concentration to lower concentration. And we're going to look at concentration or density gradients, and that's the difference between two points. And so, again, it's going to go from that higher density to that lower density until equilibrium takes place. And there's a few things that can influence diffusion. As we see here, I have viscosity, and that's how easily a liquid flows. Now, if something is very viscous, viscous it's rather thick. Now, let's take a couple of beakers. In one beaker, I'm going to put water. In the other beaker, I'm going to put corn syrup. Now, if I put a drop of dye into each beaker, which one do you think will diffuse faster, the water or the corn syrup? Well, the water, it's less viscous. It has a lower viscosity. The corn syrup has a higher viscosity. It's thicker. So that, that dye is going to take longer to diffuse through that corn syrup. Other things that can affect diffusion. Um, for instance, if I take a, a beaker of hot water, a beaker of cold water, and a beaker of room temperature water, and I put a drop of dye in each. Which one do you think is going to diffuse faster? The hot water will diffuse much faster. So heat will affect how fast diffusion takes place. Which one is going to be slower? That would be the cold water and the room temperature water somewhere in between. Uh, let's see, what else can affect uh, diffusion? How about, besides concentrations, uh, the more concentrated something is, typically the faster it'll diffuse out. Um, molecular weight. If something has a higher molecular weight, it has more mass to it, it's going to diffuse much slower than something with smaller uh, molecular weight or less mass. Think about um, uh, a speedboat compared to a large ship. Which one's going to be faster and which one's going to be slower? The speedboat, of course, is going to be much faster and it can maneuver a lot more quickly than the ship, which is larger and slower and takes more time to maneuver. So, again, lower uh, molecular weight. And I'm trying to think, um, I think that's about it. Uh, for some of the things that can affect um, uh, diffusion. Not to say that there's not others, there are. And here's some examples. Again, this is where we took the beaker and we put a, a, a dye pellet in there. As you can see, the concentration starts off high in one corner and then eventually it's going to diffuse out uh, until equilibrium is reached. In this picture, we see a skunk. How many times have you smelt a skunk uh, out on the road and then it takes you a while before you eventually come up to uh, the dead skunk in the road? Well, when the skunk first uh, met its fate, that scent, that smell, was concentrated just in that area. But eventually, it diffuses out. It's no different than taking um, some perfume or cologne and being in a room with a bunch of people and then spraying it. And it's going to be stronger where you are. People in the back of the room may not smell it. But, you know, after a period of time, it's going to diffuse throughout the entire room and then everyone could smell that scent. Okay. And again, it, it stops spreading when equilibrium has taken place. So... It moves from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So where can we apply that to the human body? Well, let's take a look at the lungs. In the lungs, we have these tiny air sacs called alveoli. 
and there are capillaries that are attached to all of these alveoli. And this is where gas exchange is going to take place. Um, and the gases predominantly are going to be oxygen and carbon dioxide. Those are the main, one, main ones that we're interested in. Now, the blood coming back from the body has given up most of its oxygen, and so the concentration of oxygen in the alveoli is going to be higher than in the capillary. It's going to be lower. So oxygen is going to diffuse from the lungs into the blood from high concentration to low concentration. The waste product coming back from the cells is going to be carbon dioxide. And so carbon dioxide is higher in the blood, but lower in the alveoli, in the lungs. So again, it's going to move from high to low, from blood to lungs. Now we're going to take a look at osmosis. I find that a lot of students have a problem really understanding the concept of osmosis. And if you're going into healthcare, this is going to be very important to understand because osmosis is going to affect uh, body tissues, it's going to affect blood, it's going to affect uh, the kidneys as far as how they filter. Uh, so you really need to have a good understanding of osmosis. So let's look at the definition. Osmosis is the diffusion of water, water being the um, universal solvent, across a selectively permeable membrane from an area of low concentration of solute to an area of high concentration of solute. So let's look at those terms. Selectively permeable membrane or semi-permeable membrane. Uh, what is that? Now you probably have an example of one of these at home. So go ahead and think about what kind of semi-permeable membrane you have at home. Okay, having a hard time? Uh, think about a window screen. A window screen is a semi-permeable or selectively permeable membrane. It's going to allow some things to go through. For instance, air can pass through it. Um, I imagine some water could pass through it. It'll hold back a lot, but it'll let some through. Fine dust can still come through a screen. Uh, but what we really want to hold back are like the flies and mosquitoes and other insects, right? So that would be an example of a selectively permeable membrane or semi-permeable membrane. Usually when we talk about um, the human body, we're talking about the cell membranes being that semi-permeable membrane. Okay. And then solutes can be salts, sugars, proteins, all of those things draw water to them. Now, we're going to talk about uh, solutes as sodium chloride. So that's the one solute that uh, we'll discuss quite a bit. But um, either of those things, the salts, sugars, or uh, proteins will draw water to them. So I say that solutes are water magnets. So keep that in your mind. Solute equals water magnet. And so let's see if we can visually explain osmosis to give you a better idea of how it works. Let's suppose we have a table and on one side of the table we put one magnet and on the other side of the table we put a whole bunch of magnets. And in the center, we're going to put a bunch of paper clips. Now these magnets are going to represent our water magnets. And you remember what a water magnet is? It's a solute. A solute is a water magnet. Okay? It's going to draw water toward it. The paper clips, they're going to represent our water. Now, if these magnets are pulling on these paper clips, which way are most of the paper clips going to go? Are they going to go to where there's one magnet on the one side of the table? Or are uh, most of the paper clips going to be pulled over to the other side of the table where there's more magnets? Well, obviously, it's going to be pulled to where there's more magnets. 
So let's look at that inside of a cell. So we have water that's inside of the cell and it has a certain amount of salt in there, sodium chloride. Okay, and so that's going to be our solutes. Now there's other things in the cell that act as a solute as well, but again we're going to use sodium chloride as the example. And um, so here we have a certain amount of solutes within the cell. And in this case, we're going to have more solutes outside of the cell. If we have more solutes outside of the cell, we say that this is a hypertonic solution. Hyper meaning above or more. So a hypertonic solution. So where do you think most of the water is going to move? Remember the paper clips are the water. Is most of the water going to move out of the cell and into the solution? Or is the water going to move from the solution into the cell? Well, where's there more water magnets? Well, in this case, there's more water magnets in the solution than they are in the cell. So it's going to take those paper clips, those that water, and it's going to draw it toward where there's more water magnets, where there's more solutes. And when it does that, you saw that the cell shrunk. Okay, when the cell shrinks, we call that crenation. Okay, crenation. And uh, so basically the, the cell shrivels up. So let's reverse it where we have more water magnets inside the cell and fewer water magnets in the solution. An example would be distilled water, for instance. Distilled water, we wouldn't have any magnets over here. There would be no solutes. Okay, but let's say we have maybe tap water and this is, uh, this has some solutes in there. Okay, if you don't have really hard water. Um, but uh, the soft water is still going to have solutes. If you've seen those commercials where they're testing the water filters and they take that meter and they say, oh, this particular water has so many parts per million of dissolved solids. Dissolved solids are your solutes. Okay. So which way is the water going to move now? Is it going to move um, from the solution into the cell? or from the cell into the solution. You have to ask yourself, where are there more water magnets, in the cell or in the solution? In this case, there's more inside the cell. So it's gonna draw that water into the cell. And we say that uh, since there's less solutes in uh, the solution here, we call that a hypotonic solution. So again, it's going to draw that water in and when it does that cell is going to swell up and it can swell up or expand to a point where it ruptures in which case we call that lysis so l-y-s-i-s -S is going to be rupturing and destruction of that cell and again that could be caused by a hypotonic solution this is why if you give someone an IV, you do not give them an IV of just tap water or distilled water because the cells will swell up and burst. So one more time, we have solute equals water magnet. It's important because large volume changes caused by water movement can disrupt normal cell function. And again, cell shrinkage or cell swelling uh, the one thing that we did mention was isotonic. Isotonic uh, solution means they will neither shrink nor swell. That's because you have the same amount of sodium or solutes inside the cell as you do in the solution. And by the way, cells contain 0.9% sodium chloride. We call this a normal saline solution. So if you ever see a an IV bag that says normal saline, then you know it's a 0.9% sodium chloride solution. So that would be isotonic. Um, actually, the same amount of water that's going in the cell is the same amount of water leaving the cell. 
and so we say that there's zero net movement of water and again the cell is not going to shrink and it's not going to swell the hypertonic solution remember there's more uh, solutes inside the solution than there is inside the cell and since the solutes are water magnets it pulls that water out of the cell and causes it to shrink down and shrivel up which we call crenation the hypotonic solution means that there's more water magnets or solutes inside the cell than inside the solution so that cell is going to draw that water into itself and that cell will swell up and if there are too few um, solutes in that solution allowing for more water to get pulled into that cell that cell can actually burst and rupture and we call that lysis i hope that helped And just looking at it graphically, here we have our semi-permeable or selectively permeable membrane. And again, that would represent the cell membrane. Here we can see that there's fewer water magnets, fewer solutes, than on this side, where there's more water magnets or solutes. And so what it's going to do then is pull that water through that selectively permeable membrane. Now that's going to hold back the solutes. They can't go through that membrane. And it's going to cause this side to become more concentrated and this side to become more dilute until they are equal percentages of solutes. Okay, so I hope you understand that. This process stops when you have the same concentration of solutes on one side as the other side. In other words, we get equilibrium. And now the next one is filtration, which wasn't mentioned in the list earlier, uh, but it is still very important. And this is going to depend on pressure differences on either side of a partition. And basically, your solution or what have you is going to move from uh, the side of greater pressure to lower pressure. An example would be in the kidneys in your information, uh, not your information, your information. Okay, no matter how I say it, it still comes out your information. Uh, the making of urine. How's that? So let's take a look at just in the tissues. Every time the heart beats, it exerts a certain pressure within capillaries. This is going to push fluid, water, into the tissues. Okay? And then every time that the, the heart is relaxed, the pressure drops within um, these capillaries, and a lot of that, that water, that that uh, fluid will then return um, back to the capillaries. Not all of it, uh, but a lot of it will. And there are other things though that uh, are in effect here as well besides just um, this filtration pressure, but that's a topic for another lecture. And next we look at mediated transport mechanisms. It involves carrier proteins. Characteristics is specificity to a single type of molecule. So for instance, if there's a specific shape and this shape fits, then it can bind to the binding site and be transported into the cell. However, if it does not fit, it cannot be transported. Now we can have competition, and this is where we have similarly uh, shaped molecules uh, that can compete for the same binding site. As a matter of fact, this is how a lot of medications work, um, where they might compete with the binding site and get brought into the cell, or 
they might partially fit and not necessarily be brought into the cell, but they will lock themselves in place and prevent the actual uh, molecule uh, from entering. And so that's where we can have some competition as well. Now, saturation is the rate of transport is limited to the number of available carrier proteins. So let's take a look at that. So if we want to bring this specific molecule into the cell, what are the limitations? Well, one is the limitation of the product itself. We have plenty of carrier proteins to bring this into the cell. Um, so this is going to be our limiting factor. Here we have pretty much the same amount of, of uh, product here to be brought into the cell and uh, plenty of carrier proteins to do the job. So we have a one-to-one -one ratio. Here, where's our limitation? Well, we have plenty of the molecule to be transported into the cell, but we're limited by how many of these carrier proteins we actually have. And going back to medications, uh, sometimes if we're not quite sure what the dosage should be for a patient, um, we will oftentimes do what's called a loading dose. And so what you're doing is instead of risking not giving enough of the medication, you will give, you'll build up a, a blood level to a point where um, all of the receptors are saturated and there's some excess medication there. And then you start lowering it until you get that one-to-one -one ratio and then you have that particular uh, medication um, kind of tailored to that patient. But again, the limitations are going to be enough product for the carriers or maybe we have more product and not enough carriers. And what can happen sometimes, and we see this in some diseases, where it'll be oversaturated by a certain product that the body makes or even by something that's ingested, some type of a drug, and the body will start to say, okay, this is too much, and it actually starts to downregulate and starts to remove receptors in order to prevent as much of this product getting inside the cell. And then we have facilitated diffusion. And this is where we go from high concentration to low concentration without metabolic energy. So energy is not required. Basically we have one of these channels, one of these receptors, and if it fits in the channel, um, then that channel is just going to change shapes and dump that product into the cell. Okay, so that's facilitated diffusion. Again, energy is not required. It reminds me of when I used to watch on the Food Network, uh, there was a TV show called Unwrapped, and they would show all of these different... Um, all of these different factories and the different things that they made and everything. And um, I remember they used to show a lot of potato chip factories. And it's like, it's amazing how many potato chip factories there were. Because it seemed like every time I watched the show, that's what you saw it was a potato chip factory. Well, how do they get the potato chips in the bag? Well, the potato chips get dumped into these hoppers and there's a bag you know, on a rotating conveyor below it. And um, basically when enough potato chips have been dumped in the hopper and it reaches a certain weight, then that, because of the springs on there and everything, the hopper just kind of closes up, at the, it pivots, closes at the top so that no more potato chips go in there. And then it dumps the potato chips into the bag and then springs back to its original shape. Well, is there a little motor that's moving that? No, it just has to do with weight. You get enough weight in there, it changes its shape and dumps the 
the uh, potato chips into the bag and then comes back to its original shape. So that's kind of how that works. We have a molecule that uh, binds to its active site. If it's the right molecule, that molecule just changes shapes and dumps that product into the cell. So that's facilitated diffusion. Active transport is going to take energy. And that energy that the cells use is ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Okay, so for instance, here's uh, ATP. Okay, and um, we need to transport this sodium. So the ATP is going to have to bind. Okay, so it binds. And here's where the energy part comes in. ATP or adenosine triphosphate. Here's your adenosine. Here, I'll, I'll show you on this one. Here's the adenosine. Here's your triphosphate, your three phosphate molecules. Well, these molecules are held together by very strong bonds. Now, when we snap one of the um, phosphates off, okay, so we snap one of the phosphates off, it's going to release energy. And that's the energy that is used then to transport uh, the sodium. Let's see if I can find my arrow. There it is. And so again, that uh, snapping off of the, the um, phosphate is going to turn that ATP into ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and energy is released. Okay and the transport takes place. Now, since we added a phosphate to this channel, we are doing what we call phosphorylating this channel. It's created a slight bond, not as strong as bond as you would have with ATP, but there's still a bond there. So when that phosphate breaks loose, um, it's going to release a little bit of energy and that energy is enough to transport that potassium back into the cell. So we have the sodium potassium transport going on here. And since they're kind of going in the opposite directions, we would call that an antiport. Secondary active transport, the ions or molecules move in the same direction, which is symport or different directions which is antiport, uh, but it's uh, sodium moves in one direction and potassium moves in the opposite direction. And so that's antiport. Now here the sodium can attach to this molecule. Okay, this, this protein. And when glucose attaches, now they're gonna both move together into the cell and that is going to be symport. So antiport, they move in opposite directions. Symport, they move in the same direction. And now we're going to look at endocytosis. Endo means inside, cyto means cell, and osis is a condition of. So this is a condition of bringing something inside of the cell. So it's internalization of substances by the formation of a vesicle. And as you can see, we have this particle. And here we have these processes that are forming. And it actually gulps it and forms a vesicle. Uh, we would call this a phagocytic vesicle. Phagocytosis means to eat. And uh, we've actually pinched off a little bubble or vesicle. Uh, which contains the particle. And so a couple of ways that we bring things inside the cell. I mentioned one, uh, and that's cell eating. Okay. And what's the other way you bring something inside yourself besides eating? Drinking. So that's right. Uh, so the two types are phagocytosis and pinocolatocytosis. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I mean pinocytosis. Okay, so that's how I, I remembered this. Back in the old days, um, when pina coladas were, were popular, that's how I memorized the cell drinking, is pinocytosis, I think of 
pino colada cytosis. Of course, I'm a little more sophisticated now. If I had to memorize this all from scratch, again, I would probably think of Pinot Noir cytosis. And don't forget, if you drink no noir, you Pinot Noir. Just saying. Anyway, so phagocytosis, cell eating, pinocytosis, cell drinking. And then after all that cell eating and drinking, you got to go to the little cells room, right? And so we have to expel things from the cell, and that is exocytosis. Exo means outside of. Cyto is cell. Osis is condition of. This is a condition of expelling something outside of the cell. And that could be waste products, or it could be something that the cell makes. Maybe the cell makes a digestive enzyme, for instance. Or maybe it's a salivary gland, and it's producing saliva. Or it's a mammary gland, and it's producing milk. Either way, it has to expel that product, and uh, it does that through exocytosis. Remember I talked about the phospholipid uh, membrane here. Uh, the phospholipid bilayer membrane acts like a soap bubble. Well, this creates another... Uh, phospholipid bilayer bubble and again since they're the same type of uh, product that phospholipid bilayer it's going to be able to fuse to the cell membrane and open up and expel its products again it could be a waste product or it could be something that the body needs and that that cell happens to make <laughs> So we've got our pina colada cytosis, I mean, sorry, oh, our pinocytosis, as you can see right here, the cell is drinking. Um, and so we have fluid and dissolved solutes in the pinocytic uh, vesicle. Here's our lysosome. Again, this is a kind of a digestive organelle within the cell that fuses, dumps that enzyme onto the stuff that uh, was taken in during pinocytosis and uh, it is then digested by the lysosomal enzymes and then we have what's called a residual body and through exocytosis it gets rid of that waste product so the difference between pinocytosis and phagocytosis is that there are no pseudopods on um, the cell membrane uh, basically what happens is the membrane dips down, sucks in this fluid, and we say it's non-selective drinking of extracellular fluid, and uh, pinches off that vesicle and goes through the process. Whereas phagocytosis, we're going to have pseudopods, and pseudo means false, pod means feet, so these little false feet that reach out and actually grab whatever it is that it's going to eat. Sometimes watch a, a video on YouTube about amoebas. Okay, just look up amoeba feeding. Okay, and you'll see that it, it has these little pseudopods that can wrap around whatever it is it's going to eat, like a paramecium or whatever, and pull it inside the cell and then digest it. Well, that's what happens with some of our cells, some of our white blood cells which are very phagocytic cells, they put out these false feet and they can grab something like a bacteria, it says here microbe, and pull that microbe uh, into the cell. Again, the lysosome binds to it. And by the way, when it brings in um, something through phagocytosis, we call this a phagosome. So the lysosome can combine with a phagosome to give you a phagolysosome. Okay, and it dumps that um, digestive enzyme, lysozyme is that enzyme, um, onto the microbe, breaking it down and digesting it. And then we have a, a residual body, again, through exocytosis, it gets rid of the um, waste product. And so that's the difference between pinocytosis and phagocytosis.